Hi, I'm Michelle Koffenberger, and I'm a research fellow with the RISE program at the University of Oxford. This is the third and final lecture of this unit, and I'll be talking about what we have learned from learning trajectories. So like I said, this is the final lecture of unit two, and I'll be talking about the findings we have from analysis of learning trajectories across a range of countries and data sources. And I'll show how the findings provide implications for policy priorities that can improve learning. So altogether, researchers with the RISE program have analyzed learning trajectories for more than 50 countries, covering more than 6 million individuals. And many researchers outside of RISE have also contributed to this type of analysis. As a sneak preview of the two main sets of findings, we find that learning trajectories are highly varied across countries, on average are low, including and especially in the early grades, and in some places are actually getting worse, not better. As a second set of findings, we find that learning trajectories show that achieving equality goals within countries will often not achieve equity goals of universal learning, as in many countries, even more advantaged groups have low learning on average. There's a lot packed into both of those, and I'm going to talk through what each of those means in much more detail in this lecture. And just to note, as with the previous lecture, the phrases learning trajectories and learning profiles are often used interchangeably. Many of the sources that I reference will call them learning profiles. We mean the same thing by them. So the first set of findings, learning trajectories vary widely and often are quite flat. Why do I say that? How do we know that? Well, as one example, this study using demographic and health surveys data across more than 50 countries finds massive variation in learning trajectories across those countries. So in Nigeria, as you can see in this figure, among young women with six years of schooling and no higher, only about 10% can read a simple sentence in a language of their choosing. While in Rwanda, on the other hand, nearly 100% of young women with six years of schooling can read a simple sentence, and we see everything in between. So it's critical to analyze and understand the learning trajectory for a specific context because they do vary so much. We also can see that in some countries, the learning trajectory is really quite flat. For a country like Nigeria or Bangladesh, extending the learning trajectory for more years of schooling wouldn't achieve anything close to a goal like universal literacy. We also find that these findings are consistent. We have similar findings from different data using a completely different literacy assessment. So these learning trajectories come from the Financial Inclusion Insight Surveys, which were household-based surveys and included a simple literacy test administered to the adult respondents. Here we see similarly wide variation in learning outcomes. We also find that across countries, differences in learning per year emerge early. These graphs come from Young Lives panel data, which followed the same children across multiple years. And across the four countries with this data, we find that at age five, there are very small differences. And these graphs are a little hard to read, but the main point is that in the first graph, those lines are all very close together. Very small differences in learning outcomes at age five, but much larger differences just three years later at age eight. In particular, the India-Vietnam gap in scores is only about 50 points at age five, which is about half of a standard deviation. And that grows to about 150 by age eight. So three times larger, about a standard deviation and a half. So improvements are needed in those early years to ensure that children don't fall behind and miss foundations very early on in, those, in their schooling. And we have similar findings within countries as well. This figure draws on data from a study in India which compares children's learning levels with the average learning levels represented by the red line in this figure with the curricular expectations, which is represented by the blue and black line, the, the bluish black line there in the middle. If children were keeping pace with the curricular expectations, the red line would overlap with the blue line. As you can see, instead, in every grade past grade one, children are far behind the expectations. So what do we learn from this figure? Well, looking at that first orange star, we can see that children who don't gain foundational skills early on 
often still have not gained them even by grade eight, with many children in grade six, seven, and eight still at a grade two or three learning level. All of those gray dots represent children, and you can see that many in six, grades six, seven, and eight are still at those very low levels of learning relative to where the curriculum expects them to be. These children's learning has flattened off. Because they've missed critical foundational skills, they've fallen behind the level of instruction. So even if they stay in school, they're not really learning because they're too far behind. They can't get, engage meaningfully with the instruction. Second, looking at that second orange star, by grade eight, there's massive variation in skill levels, spanning about five to six grade levels, which you can see with that bracket there. This makes it nearly impossible for teachers to effectively teach such a wide set of learning levels in a single grade level. Try to put yourself in those teachers' shoes. How could you possibly provide meaningful instruction to children at a grade two level and a grade eight level and everything in between in a single classroom? This often leads teachers to teach to the top of the class because they're the ones that are most close uh, to the uh, to being able to engage with the curriculum um, and leaves many of the other students far behind. And then finally, by grade eight, children are on average four years behind the curriculum. So just very far behind the intended learning outcomes and the learning expectations. So what we find is that when learning trajectories flatten off, it means that children are falling behind the level of instruction and ceasing to learn. When children can't read or do foundational mathematics, they can't keep up with the content in later grades. Two policy priorities are indicated in that. So the first is to prioritize foundational literacy and numeracy as building blocks for later learning so that those learning trajectories don't flatten off. The second is to better align the curriculum with the pace of children's learning so that children are not left behind. Lastly, for this section, another finding from the work on learning trajectories is that in many places, trajectories are not improving and sometimes are actually getting worse, not better. This graph draws on the Indonesia Family Life Surveys, which is panel data that followed the same households over time, and that included a series of math questions. The study found that during a period of large increases in education spending and reforms, learning actually declined slightly, which suggests that business as usual improvements um, are not going to achieve learning goals. Something like financing alone is not enough to steepen those learning trajectories. More of the same is not going to work to achieve universal learning. We need different types of approaches. In the second set of findings, we see that policy simulations using learning trajectories show that more schooling will not address the learning crisis on its own. This study drew on the same financial inclusion insights data that I showed earlier and used learning trajectories to simulate possible gains from increasing years of schooling at observed learning trajectories. In this figure, the gray bars represent current literacy levels in each of the countries, and the orange bars represent literacy levels if all young adults had completed primary school. The study found that expanding to universal primary completion across the nine countries with this data would increase literacy by only 8.5 percentage points on average, leaving nearly 30% illiterate. What's happening is that flat learning trajectories, especially in the early grades, mean children won't achieve basic skills even from additional schooling at those current learning trajectories. Their trajectories need to steepen in order to reach those learning goals. This is another study simulating the possible learning gains from increased schooling. And this one did, did modeling based on learning trajectories, which found that universal completion of grade 10 amongst the countries that have this data would not increase the percentage of those achieving the SDGs at all. So in this figure, the black bars are the percent of 15 year olds in each of these learning levels or score brackets based on current schooling attainment. And again, these are simulations using PISA D data. Children scoring over 400 on this scale have reached the SDG for basic mathematics proficiency. 
So you can see that at current schooling and learning levels, only about 7% of children in these PISA-D countries are reaching the SDG4 goal. Now, the pink bars are the learning levels if all children completed grade 10, a massive increase in schooling attainment from the current 30% or so up to 100%. But achieving universal completion does not change at all the fraction of the cohort achieving the SDG learning goal. That pink bar and black bar above the 400 line are the same. All of the learning gains are at the very low levels of learning. What's going on is that most children who had dropped out had already fallen behind the curriculum and the level of instruction and couldn't keep up with what was being taught even before they dropped out. So the massive increase in schooling moves most children from not learning while out of school to not learning while in school. Finally, in the third set of findings, policy simulations using learning trajectories show that achieving equality goals often will not achieve equity goals of learning for all. This study simulated achieving equality of outcomes for girls and boys. A lot of focus currently in global education space goes to girls' education, and rightfully so. Girls need and deserve a strong education. But it's important to examine what narrow goals of equality would actually achieve. So these simulations show that across 10 low- and middle-income countries with this data, the achieving schooling equality for girls would increase girls' literacy by only about 6 percentage points, leaving more than 30% still functionally illiterate. Achieving both schooling and learning equality for girls, likewise, would increase their literacy by only about eight percentage points. Why aren't their learning gains larger? Well, because boys aren't learning that much in school either. So rather than gender-specific solutions, in a lot of contexts, the system needs to be re reoriented to provide a quality education for all children, girls and boys. Now, these represent sim similar simulations um, as those gender simulations across five countries with Osser and Uezo learning data, but this time looking at SES. So these simulate achieving equality of schooling, learning, or both for the poor relative to the top 20% um, quintile in each country. And here the gains are larger than for gender. So in India, achieving equality of schooling and learning for the poor with the top quintile would increase basic numeracy by almost 30 percentage points, up to 62%. In most countries, this kind of equality increases outcomes by about 20 percentage points. But even with equality, still 20 to 40% of the poor are not reaching even basic foundational numeracy. And that's because learning is low on average, even among the better off in these contexts. So learning outcomes need to improve for nearly all children, and addressing these needs are going to need to involve a systems approach. So in conclusion, I've shown you evidence that learning trajectories vary widely and often are flat. I've also shown that more years of schooling will not resolve the learning crisis. Typical learning trajectories are just too flat. More learning per year is going to be necessary to reach learning goals. Furthermore, I've also shown evidence that equality across groups will leave many without basic skills. In most places, the education system needs to improve learning for nearly all children. And foundational literacy and numeracy in the early schooling years should be prioritized as these are the building blocks for later learning. Otherwise, children fall behind the level of curriculum and instruction and stop learning. Their learning trajectories flatten off, even if they stay in school. And then finally, because learning trajectories vary tremendously, analysis of particular countries and contexts is important for informing policy priorities in a particular context. Here are a few additional resources that might be useful. There's a special issue in the International Journal of Educational Development that has a number of papers, I think about 12 papers on what they call learning profiles, but again, which we mean interchangeably with learning trajectories, and the RISE program hub for learning trajectories is available too with many more resources. Thank you very much.